Roger Fink was a social work major at Concordia College in Nebraska before going on to graduate study in sociology at the University of Washington, where he finished his PhD in 1984. He shopped around as an assistant professor for a few years, starting at another Concordia College, this time in Illinois, then Loyola of Chicago, and finally Purdue University, where he climbed the academic ladder from 1989 to 2000. In 2000, he moved to Penn State's sociology department, where he spent the rest of his career. Lawrence Yannacone earned a BS in mathematics from Stanford in 1975, followed by graduate study first in math and then economics at the University of Chicago. He completed his PhD in economics from Chicago in 1984, the same year that Fink graduated. His longest academic job was back in the Bay Area at Santa Clara University with several research visits to the Hoover Institution at Stanford. In 2002, he moved to George Mason University with support from the Koch Foundation, remaining there for seven years before moving again to his present position at Chapman University in Chicago. Fink and Yannickone teamed up to combine their sociology and economics backgrounds in this classic paper that tries to apply principles of free market competition to religious life. While many scholars find it hard to think about religious faith as a commodity and different religions as products for which consumers shop in the marketplace, this idea has generated a whole subfield of study, particularly in the United States, where the free market is itself a kind of religion. While the historical context of Christianity in Europe provided sociology with the ideal type constructs of universal church and particularistic sect, Sociologists in the United States found their own historical context demanded a new intermediate type that they called a denomination. During the 20th century, this idea of pluralistic, tolerant denominations got absorbed into yet another ideal type construct, the free market. This idea, most popular in professional economics, but spreading throughout popular American thought due to the missionary zeal of the economists, also emerges as an abstract ideal type from a particular historical experience. But originally this had nothing to do with religion. The free market assumes many things about the people participating in it. Everyone can be both a producer who supplies some things and a consumer who demands other things. Everyone has access to possible exchanges with everyone else. The term market is singular, not plural. Suppliers will sell to any customer and will seek out those who will pay the highest price. Consumers will buy from any producer and will seek out those who charge the lowest price. Everybody competes with everybody else to buy and sell everything. If this competition drives up the price of something, more producers will decide to produce more of it, while fewer consumers will demand less of it. These personal desires will all balance out as though an invisible hand were guiding their choices to produce an equilibrium where everybody gets their best possible personal results at a price determined by this impersonal market. This image of interchangeable buyers and sellers haggling in a marketplace has become the dominant ideal type concept in American society, reaching an almost religious status in itself. So it was only a matter of time before the economists would think of the possibility that the principles observed in free market competition for burgers and fries or for car insurance might also give us insights into our religious attitudes and behavior. Fink and Yana Kohn are part of a modern day crusade to reinterpret religious life using the language of free market economics. Now, before we look into the specifics of their argument, we ought to ask ourselves an important question that doesn't come up in their article. Is there such a thing as a built-in demand for religion in people, the same way that we have a demand for food or water or clothing or a shelter to live in? Is religion a necessity? Even before The Economist, other scholars had answered this question in the affirmative. Sociologists of religion have been very fond of saying that every society needs some kind of religious glue to hold itself together, to give people shared moral values and some kind of compass 
that allows them all to agree on fundamental goals for social life, as well as the correct or incorrect ways to reach those goals. Charles Darwin's son, Christopher, called religion the cohesive force which allows a society or culture to exist at all in the first place. Societies without this glue will fall apart, leaving the world filled only with societies that do have it. But this is not quite the same thing as saying that you or I as human beings have some kind of innate, almost instinctive need for a religion. Plenty of theologians have argued that this is exactly the case, and even William James, one of the founders of the field of psychology in the United States, wrote a book called Varieties of Religious Experience, dealing with this question of an innate human need for religion. Presumably, if we have this innate need, any individuals attempting to live without religion will run into serious trouble, perhaps mental illness or other psychological damage. Such an innate human need for religion, like that for food or oxygen, would justify the simplifying assumption made by Fink and Yannickone when they claim that religious demand tends to be very stable over time, if not actually a constant quantity in human life. On the other hand, if our demand for religion more closely resembles our demand for mobile phones or carbonated soft drinks, we might have to rethink that assumption. Demand for non-essential items exists, but fluctuates in response to efforts to stimulate or reduce it. We'll come back to this point. For now, we'll let them get away with the simplifying assumption that the demand for religion remains fairly constant, a kind of spiritual background radiation throughout the universe. This assumption allows them to conclude that dramatic changes in religious activity do not reflect a fundamental shift in demand, in the needs of a society or of individuals. Instead, they argue, such changes in activity happen because the society has changed how it regulates the supply of religion. The free market imagery moves to center stage here. Every society always has plenty of entrepreneurs ready to make saddles for horses, cell phones for students, beer for football fans, and also religion for everybody. Prohibition might ban alcohol, and although some bootleggers would still operate, consumption would go down and fewer people would die of cirrhosis of the liver and road accidents. But the free market as an ideal type concept insists that such restrictions on the free market always leave people more dissatisfied than they would be if the buyers and sellers could operate freely without such restrictions. This also applies to religion. Great awakenings, they claim, were nothing more or less than successful marketing campaigns of upstart evangelical Protestants, launched when restrictions on new sects and itinerant preaching diminished. Their first example goes all the way back to the 1730s and 1740s in colonial America, when preachers like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield roamed around the countryside giving public sermons about the sinful age of that time and the need for spiritual renewal. The great popular response to these sermons has been called the First Great Awakening, a movement that has been studied ever since by scholars, most of whom viewed it as a dramatic increase in the demand for spiritual experience, not a byproduct of structural changes in society's regulation of religion. This first example of what they call supply-side changes in regulation of religion is interesting, but if you read carefully, you will find that they mix together examples like Whitefield's preaching, which came in the early 1700s, and other outbursts of religious fervor that came along in the early 1800s, almost a century later. These later outbursts often have been called the second rather than the first Great Awakening. As we will see next, this second Great Awakening does seem to line up quite well with their description of supply-side changes in how religion was regulated. Once all the different American colonies came together into the United States, and adopted the constitutional compromise that set up a barrier between church and state. But they do not suggest any such structural explanation for how or why Edwards and Whitefield were able to launch such a successful first great awakening 40 years before the Declaration of Independence. At that point, they confess, each colony still maintained a rigid artificial monopoly for one official church, 
supporting it with revenue from taxes on the entire population and persecuting deviant alternative groups. By 1776, they declare, these several colonial religious monopolies still very much controlled religious life, so much so that most colonies were able to suppress the first great awakening and ban itinerant preachers. Thus, they actually have no real supply side motor for the first great awakening. This is one weak point in their thesis. Supply side theory rests on the assumption of a fairly steady state background demand for some kind of religious experience, either to keep the society glued together or to satisfy some basic human need. Given such a basic need or demand, the marketplace could be an efficient way to guarantee that it is satisfied by producers of religious services. A big variable from this point of view is the extent to which a particular culture or legal system allows that marketplace to operate, or conversely, creates what we might call restraint of trade in religion, setting up one official religion and enforcing a monopoly for its leaders over all of spiritual life. In the latter category, we would have to put the high priests of nearly all ancient civilizations, looking down on the people they ruled from the tops of pyramids or the towers of great stone-walled cities. In more recent centuries, the Pope in Rome exercised this kind of monopoly power over a considerable fraction of the entire European landmass, while Hinduism has flourished and controlled life on much of the Indian subcontinent for literally thousands of years. Such monopoly restrictions on what the economists now like to call the religious marketplace might be the normal human condition down through history. In the much shorter span of U.S. history, this same norm of religious monopoly emerged as the default starting approach in virtually every American colony. We started with a doctrine called establishment, the term for such religious monopolies. People who believe in this model are establishmentarians. Fink and Yannickone don't explain very clearly why we abandoned this default starting position. At some points in the article, they seem to imply that the entrepreneurs of the first great awakening weakened that system somehow, and that the constitutional compromise separating church from state simply recognized the potential market efficiencies that these entrepreneurs had demonstrated. Most historians have a very different explanation. Although nearly all the 13 colonies had official state churches, as documented in this article, they disagreed rather violently about which church that should be. Connecticut would never have agreed to setting up the Church of England as the Church of the United States. Neither would the Catholics in Maryland. The Virginia planters would never have agreed to allow the Congregationalist dissenters in New England to become the Church of the United States. As a result, nobody was allowed to claim the prize. It was a matter of politics, not of economics. Once that was decided, though, the watchword of the day became disestablishment the systematic removal of all forms of state support for particular religious groups. Public taxes could no longer be used to pay salaries or pensions for ministers. The state could not give away any more land or other kinds of property to churches. They would have to buy their own land and pay for their own buildings from the pockets of their members. Schools could not favor the doctrines or practices of one group over another in the lessons taught to students. Disestablishment did, in fact, take a long step towards opening up the religious marketplace as advocated by our free market economists. The results of this religious deregulation also pretty much fit what the economists would expect to happen. While the established colonial church, that is, Congregationalists in New England, Catholics in Maryland, and Anglicans in the Southern colonies, each maintained their control over the social and economic high ground in the coastal cities where the colonial population originally had concentrated, they did not stoop to compete for the religious allegiance of lower status people who scattered out into the frontier territories of the new nation. They remained saltwater churches close to the ocean and the trade that made their members rich. But on the frontier, groups that could invent innovative new ways to reach potential members could reap a rich harvest of souls, the Baptists discovered the mechanism of the revival or camp meeting. 
a temporary assembly of people coming out of the surrounding woods and fields from every direction for a festival of preaching and prayer and emotional conversions. After the revival, new Baptist churches would spring up like mushrooms after the rain. The Methodists invented a different new idea. Instead of assigning their preachers to a particular church, they sent them out with Bibles in their saddlebags and instructions to cover the countryside of a particular region, stopping at every cabin and camp they could find, preaching to families one at a time. Other travelers often remarked that no matter where they went, a Methodist circuit rider already had been there before them. Results of this innovative entrepreneurship appeared quickly and decisively. Even without looking at religion on the frontier, which would be very difficult to do, Fink and Yana Cohn provide evidence that between 1776 and 1850, even within the already settled territory of New England, the share of churchgoers who were Baptist and Methodist more than tripled, and the share of Congregationalists, the old Saltwater Pilgrim Church, fell from about two-thirds to only about one-fourth of all church members. This does not mean that the dynamic new denominations were stealing the Congregationalists' members. Those congregations continued to grow along with the total population. But the Baptists and Methodists grew so much faster that they dramatically expanded their share of the total religious marketplace. This result can only mean, of course, that the total size of the religious marketplace also grew very rapidly. Aside from pure population growth, which also took place, Fink and Yannickone assert that a larger share of the total population started going to church as a result of entrepreneurial efforts to compete for new members. The Second Great Awakening in the early 1800s does look like exactly what the authors think it is, evidence that deregulating the religious marketplace is good for specific religious groups and also good for the population that needs some kind of religious life. Such historical interpretation is interesting, but Fink and Yannickon then shift much closer to the present with an even more interesting example. They review the way that the U.S. government reacted to the spread of radio and television in the 20th century. The Federal Communication Commission decided that private companies could only have rights to use the public airwaves for their profitable new businesses if they agreed to provide something valuable to the public in return. This something turned out to be a requirement to offer free airtime to religious groups to broadcast inspirational programs instead of commercials selling soap or radio serials about the Lone Ranger. For convenience, as much as anything else, the FCC delegated the matter of choosing which programs would be broadcast to the National Council of Churches, a cozy club composed of the leaders of the biggest mainline denominations in the country. This gave those denominations an effective monopoly on religious broadcasting. Small-scale entrepreneurs were shut out of the market. The result was some of the most boring radio and television broadcasting ever created, perhaps even more boring than what comes out of the state-run television stations of many European countries today, when they aren't showing dubbed American programs. But then the commercial interests of the big broadcasting companies lined up with the lobbying efforts of smaller-scale fundamentalist sects, and the FCC changed its rules. From that point to the present, broadcasters could meet the test of providing some kind of public good by giving airtime to religious groups, but they could also make those groups pay for the airtime. Of course, the broadcasters loved this. The small-scale religious entrepreneurs like Jim and Tammy Faye Baker with their Praise the Lord television ministry in North Carolina, were not thrilled about having to pay to broadcast, but they proved to be so effective at asking people to send the money that they turned this problem into an opportunity and became extremely wealthy out of it. The mainline churches that had gotten used to free airtime never could make the adjustment to the new market conditions any more than the saltwater churches could motivate themselves to chase after converts on the frontier a hundred years earlier. The result of this more recent deregulation is still the subject of great debate. Were more people actually involved in religion after the media evangelists got going? Or did these evangelists simply lure their members away from the more old-fashioned denominations that still depended on a network of face-to-face -face congregations?
While it is obvious that some religious entrepreneurs have prospered, perhaps at the expense of other religious groups, it remains much more difficult to say whether American society as a whole and the people in it are better off as a result of this example of deregulation. After the poorly supported example of the first Great Awakening in the 1700s, and then the clearer examples of the Second Great Awakening in the 1800s and the rise of media evangelism in the late 1900s, Fink and Yannickone have one more example, they say, demonstrates how deregulation can transform the religious marketplace. This time they're not talking about disestablishment of government support for particular religions. They are not talking either about governments suddenly allowing broadcasters to put a price on what had been free public interest programming and let all comers fight over the right to buy that airtime by selling it to the highest bidder instead of to one group judged by somebody to be more religiously deserving than another. Instead, this time they are talking about government deregulation of restrictions on which people can physically move into American society as immigrants. In the last third of the 20th century, the United States radically changed the laws governing immigration. Immediately, the stream of immigrants shifted, and ever since that change, immigrants have come overwhelmingly from Asia and Latin America instead of from Europe. Fink and Yana Cohn argue that this immigration change provided a sudden influx of religious leaders mixed in among the other immigrants, and these swamis and gurus and other exotic religious types quickly proved their entrepreneurial skills by attracting followers, not just from among the immigrant groups themselves, but from the general mass of the U.S. population. In other words, they argue that all the recent popularity of New Age mysticism and wearing orange pajamas and all the rest of it resulted from a supply-side shift of additional religious entrepreneurs, not from any demand-side change in people's religious consciousness or other hard-to-measure conditions. This explanation remains quite controversial right down to the present, but it at least gives you something to think about. If we shut off immigration after 2020, just as we did after 1920, will the New Age and Eastern religions gradually fade back into the fringes of the American religious scene? We'll see. To reinforce their argument, Fink and Yannickon then close their article with a warning that the United States may be shifting back to greater government regulation and restriction of the religious marketplace. This seems like quite a stretch if you search the internet today for religious possibilities, but they cite an actual court case from Oregon in the 1990s, just before their article was published. Two guys who ingested peyote hallucinogens as part of a Native American religious ritual were fired from a drug rehab center and then were denied unemployment benefits. The first court to hear their case said they had been denied freedom of religion and should get the benefits. But the U.S. Supreme Court decided they had been fired for a just cause, ingesting illegal drugs, and not for their religious beliefs. If religious beliefs lead to illegal actions, those actions are still crimes. They were denied benefits because they were fired for a crime, not because they had certain beliefs. They could eat more peyote if they wanted to and if they didn't get caught doing it. Arguing that this is regulation of religion raises tricky questions. What if your religion preaches human slavery or perhaps even human sacrifice? Will any religious belief take precedence over any law? Is this a case of civil law controlling religion or of religion taking over civil law? Tricky, tricky. However you feel about the peyote case, as it came to be known, the basic argument of this article should be crystal clear by now. The assumed moral superiority of the free market, competition, and efficiency in production and allocation of goods and services becomes the highest value against which all social activities, including religious life, are to be judged. If governments artificially regulate and restrict activity in the religious marketplace, the whole society will be the loser. After you're done with this article, I hope you'll continue to think about this assumption. Is this in fact the highest and best criterion against which we should judge everything we think and do? Are there any negative aspects to religious competition that might warrant some kind of regulation or restriction? Two sides of the coin of this free market argument come to mind. 
Probably you can come up with several others if you think about it. On the head side of this free market coin, we have the claim that not only is competition in the religious marketplace good for some of the competitors, that is, the ones who win, but it's also good for society as a whole. This society-wide good could come in a couple of ways. If we agree that anybody who wins in the competition should automatically be defined as providing a better religious product, then the quality of religious services might be increased. Unregulated competition in other fields has a somewhat spotty record on this score. Without regulation and inspection, the winners in the early days of the meatpacking industry turned out some pretty questionable sausages for sale in the food stores of the nation. Without regulation and inspection, car manufacturers refused to use safety glass and windshields or put seat belts into their cars. Without regulation and inspection, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker went to prison for fraud and criminal conspiracy to cheat their viewers out of a fortune in cash. Beyond questions about quality, we also might ask about the quantity of religious services being delivered to the population. Here again, we find a rather spotty record. During the past 30 years of expansion of all kinds of media evangelism, non-denominational churches competing for membership with older mainline denominations, and all kinds of new and exotic religious entrepreneurs of every description, the share of young adults in the United States who say they actually belong to some kind of organized religion has taken a nosedive, and the share who say none has jumped from 10% in 1986 to nearly 40% by 2016. It's hard to argue that religious competition has done anything good for the religious life of the American population as a whole. The other side of the coin for the free market argument is that competition between religious groups could actually be harmful to the society as a whole. The deepest root of this argument goes back to the idea that religion provides a consensus, a kind of social glue related to ultimate values and moral judgments about behavior, and that such consensus must exist as a precondition before you can even consider having things like a free market itself. A free market only operates if buyers and sellers trust each other. If they hate each other, they're not going to do much buying and selling. The founders of the United States, when drafting the Constitution and other laws, declared that one of their greatest fears was the danger of faction, people splitting up into opposed groups so that they could no longer cooperate to defend the country or operate a free market or anything else. A collection of fiercely competing religious groups face an almost irresistible temptation to look around in society for other kinds of groupings, such as Democrats versus Republicans or conservatives versus liberals, and to try to capture at least one side of such factions to support a particular religious group. In exchange, the religious group can turn political opponents into wicked, dangerous tools of the devil, enemies who we might be justified in killing rather than defeating at the ballot box. The intensity of religious competition in society might have other consequences besides just economic efficiency.